This is Bewilderbeasts, an infotainment show dedicated to inspiring curiosity for all ages by investigating the ways animals intersect at humanity. I am not a historian, an ethologist, a researcher, a scientist, a zoologist, a trained audio engineer, or an expert in, well, anything. Y'all, I'm lucky if I can remember to put my clean laundry in the dryer before it gets funky. And while I make every effort to present things as accurately as I can with a fun flair, I'm going to mess up. And that's okay. I hope I've given you a nice place to jump off from on your own adventures into curiosity. Or at the very least, I've given you the key to win your next round of trivia. Hello and welcome to Bill Wilderbeasts. I'm your host, Melissa McHugh McGrath, still recording from the closet underneath the stairs, feet from where my cat just yacked all over the floor. Today, we're going to talk about some animals that you might not think about for Thanksgiving, and we go on a journey about Thanksgiving. Okay, let's go. everyone. I'm recording this before Sunday's book launch event with One Pagan, but this comes out the morning after. So I'm going to do my best to recap what happened last night. It was amazing. There was this weird thing with a cow and a lamppost. You guys just should have been there. I mean, we only had one mishap with technical difficulties, and it was when my cat walked across the keyboard and switched everything in the chat to Azerbaijani. It was quite a time. And if you went last night and any of those things actually happened, I swear I had no idea. (laughs) And so today I have two shout outs as well. One, Danny. They contacted me last month about many things and their subject will come up after Thanksgiving. And there's so much to dig through. And I'm so excited on this particular subject, which I'm going to keep as a surprise for now because I want to get it done right. So big thanks to Danny for supporting the show at the highest level. They also sent in a few emails with some great links and is listening in Alaska. So stay warm, Danny. I know the daylight savings time up there is even worse than it is here. So sending lots of support. And thanks for being just such an awesome human. And speaking of cool humans, thank you, Travis. Honestly, I think Danny and Travis would get along like two piranhas on a corn dog. I think that's a good thing, right? I don't know. Anyway, Travis, thank you for supporting the show. (laughs) When I saw your name pop up, I dropped my phone and was so surprised and incredibly flattered. Travis is a historian who's been able to travel the world, diving into way deeper things than I do for this show, and is following his curiosity. He also has the best hair of anyone I know, and I'll say it, the best footwear. I've loved watching him figure out where he needs to be and who he is, and for that... Trav, the world is a much better place. So if you would like a shout out on the show or even use it to shout out someone else, sign up for patreon.com slash bewilderbeastpod and there you can support it at any level and get a shout out, stickers, unending thanks, bonus episodes, and with the holidays coming up, if you want an animal or someone to back you up on getting an animal, like a pony or a screaming cockroach or a guinea pig or whatever, Support the show and I'll write you a letter of recommendation. These are my favorite thing to write. And for you, Travis and Danny, just let me know which animals you want and who it should be addressed to. (laughs) So anyway, this week with Thanksgiving holiday coming up, I figured it was time to dive headfirst, turducken style, into the business end of the turkey and just put it out there. The first Thanksgiving feast. There was absolutely no football. Craft brews weren't up to par yet. Your grandmother's secret recipe for stuffing didn't exist. And guess what else didn't exist? Your grandma. Or cranberry sauce in a can. Those crunchy little onion things on the green bean casserole? Those weren't there yet either. Or pre-made pie crusts. None of these things existed. But most, Gasperthy of all, turkey wasn't even the centerpiece. It was probably a deer duckin. So, if you thought about putting your arm elbow deep into a turkey was gross. Ugh. So if turkey didn't exist in the way that we think, but we celebrate Thanksgiving with these, quote, traditional things, what did they eat? Well, buckle up, bring an EpiPen, 
And if you're shellfish allergic, this might be really gross. Okay, well, let's just get into it, okay? This story is going to be a story told from a couple of different perspectives, but it all starts in 1621. That was the year that, well, turns out there wasn't a whole lot listed. I'm going to do my best. Bono was not born, Hitler was not killed, and the Library of Congress did not exist because there also wasn't a Congress. But that means it also didn't burn down? Y'all, this is hard. But according to onthisday.com, some pretty great things did happen. April 15th. Tax Day, if we had taxes in the 1600s. Hugo Grudius, great name by the way, arrives in France after escaping prison in a book chest. I have no idea what that is or who that is or what he did, but I'm intrigued. October 25th, two months before Christmas, Governor Bradford, governor of what eventually became Massachusetts, disallows sport on Christmas Day. What a party pooper. I bet he just thought his team would lose flag football. Man, those Puritans were buzzkills. And on March 16th, a Native American chief visits the colony of Plymouth, Massachusetts. Now, in this historical events list, there isn't really a date for the fourth Thursday of uh, November. You know, the first Thanksgiving feast that was supposed to be held. Well, there's a huge asterisk here and a reason for it being left out in the list, and we will get to it. In fact, the only mention of Turkey was in October, when the country of Turkey and Poland signed the Peace of Chotin, or Kotin. Chotin? Kotan. I don't know how to say it. I didn't look it up either. Guys, this is a long episode. (laughs) But what we do know, the Wampanoag tribe had been in what was known as Eastern Massachusetts and Rhode Island 12,000 years, as of 1621. 12,000. That's a really long time. To put it in perspective, it's about as long as 2020 felt. And then the colonists arrived. The most significant were on the Mayflower. You might have heard of it. The Wampanoag leader, Massasoit, arrived in March of 1620. This was in that list of very important things that happened in 1620 and 21 that I just read. Massasoit rolled in to educate these, well, let's face it, these incredibly unprepared English runaways in the art of survival. He was half successful. Only half of the 102 colonists died that first year. So after the pilgrims successfully harvested their first crops that fall in 1621, Massasoit and 90 warriors came to bring those numbers up to at least 140 people. Cough. Men. Cough to eat and partake in games. Historians say that they most likely ran races and shot at targets for fun. The English likely ate off of tables while the indigenous people dined on the ground, which is a stark difference in the image that y'all might have in your heads of everyone sitting peacefully around a big picnic-style table. But funny enough, Governor Bradford, you know, that guy, Mr. Buzzkill, he banned the same games and activities at Christmas time because... When you're a Puritan governor in the darkest part of the year without a Nintendo Switch, you get cranky and take all the joy away from everyone else. And they partied hard for three days, you might imagine. As one writer noted, it took two days for the Wampanoags to walk to Plymouth Plantation, so you just have to make it worth it. Our discussion begins with you sitting there imagining the first feast, which features the bird. (laughs) Now think of your Thanksgiving table plate, pictures you drew in school, icons of the holiday. Now, just burn that because it's totes wrong. The Wampanoags contributed five deer to the dinner. I mean, it is hunting season right now, so I guess it tracks. Wear your blaze orange. So picture instead of a turkey with those like little white chef hat lookalike thingies in the butt area. Now picture a deer on its back just roasted in a pan with those same little chef hat thingies on their hooves, which are standing straight up in the air. (laughs) Makes a whole different kind of centerpiece, doesn't it? Being elbow deep in a turkey carcass is downright appealing compared to stuffing a whole deer with stouffers. But there were also birds here at this first feast, and fish and wild turkeys, not the fat butterball kind, but instead scrawny, gamey ones. 
There were ducks and swan and geese and, yep, our favorite friend, the pigeon. The now extinct passenger pigeons were so plentiful at the time that you could hear them 15 minutes before you saw them. Easy pickings, especially with the muskets that the English had on hand. Larger birds were boiled, so I hope you like boiled swan for your authentic Thanksgiving feast. Mmm. While stuffing may have been a thing, it certainly wasn't with bread because the Puritans didn't have wheat. They had maize, so maybe it was a cornbread of sorts, but I'm sure it tastes nothing like what you are thinking of right now. With the birds, there was probably a stuffing of chunks of onion and herbs. Chunks. They didn't have food ninjas back then, so chunky onions it was. So one bird for another. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Still pretty Thanksgiving-y, right? But hold on to your butts, kids, because if your mom, aunt, or weird uncle brings a main course to have on the table of a traditional food, they would maybe bring eel or shellfish. Bring your EpiPens, kids. Lobsters, clams, mussels, they also would have been plentiful or absolutely on the table for this three-day binge-eating journey. So go ahead, bring a lobster pie to your friends giving this year. It's tradition. But what we learn in school, the native people showed the colonists how to plant native crops. Fields were planted in the spring of 1620 and 21, which likely included turnips, carrots, onions, garlic, pumpkins, etc. The pumpkins were not made for pie or carving. Y'all, you need butter and wheat to make a crust? Oh, and they didn't have potatoes either. Those haven't made it from South America yet. Cranberry sauce in a can? Way out. Though 50 years after this event, there is documentation of the English boiling cranberries and adding a whole lot of sugar to make a sauce to eat with meat. Because what else? Because without potatoes, wheat, and butter, and honestly barely holding on to their own lives at this point, meat, 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 and more meat was likely the menu. It was basically the first Atkins diet. So the Thanksgiving holiday we think of today came into its own in the mid-1800s, 200 years after the first feast, which I'm going to spoil the ending of the episode. What we were taught is all wrong, but we'll get there. For now, we are in the 1800s. Two writings were discovered at this time. One was from Governor Buzzkill Bradford himself. It was a manuscript called Of Plymouth Plantation. Both of these writings were published and put back into the public eye to reminisce about the good old days. A Boston clergyman named Alexander Young said that the feast was the first Thanksgiving, which, as you'll see, was not right. Stick with me for a bit. People at the Plymouth Plantation call this three-day eat fest the harvest celebration of 1621. They do not call it Thanksgiving, and you will see why. You see, there was a certain nostalgia for colonial times. You know, remember the good old days. When we took land from natives and half of us died of starvation. And pie wasn't even pie. There was no butter or sugar. So naturally, humans did what humans do. We get nostalgic and make up a whole new thing, call it tradition, and rewrite history. So by the 1850s, most states and territories were celebrating what is now called Thanksgiving. Why? Well... You might not know Sarah Jessica Hale by name, but I promise you, you know her work. She wrote that absolute banger, Mary Had a Little Lamb, and some other poetic hits in the day. Although she advocated heavily for Thanksgiving in her editorials, Sarah Josepha Hale did not tie the pilgrims with Thanksgiving until a brief mention in 1865. In 1872, in America's Thanksgiving hymn, she credits the pilgrims as being, quote, Free to do and pray and keep a sober gladness their first Thanksgiving day. Sober isn't a thing I personally associate with the holiday, but going back to tradition, the colonizers were probably nearly as sober as church mice, as they likely only had water to drink. If they had beer, there was likely only a few gallons for 150 people, so it wasn't really that kind of party. Y'all, Sarah Josepha Hale didn't even suggest that the pilgrims ate food at this first harvest. There is no feast mentioned in her pleas to the people and presidents. Yes, presidents. She tried multiple times with six different presidents to get Thanksgiving recognized as a national holiday. Her thought was just take the day off, pray, and be glad for Thanksgiving. Again, more on this in a minute. Sarah Josepha Hale eventually got through to President Lincoln, the last president of her six that she had petitioned to get Thanksgiving on the menu. 
she successfully used the Civil War to get a foothold. Hey, let's unite the country with a big meal? I mean, sobriety and not having food wasn't working, so she had to try something different, and it worked. Keep in mind, though, Sarah Josepha Hale was a writer and the first American woman editor of any publication. Before Thanksgiving was even a thing, Hale used her platform in magazines and books and printed recipes and menus. Most famously, at least at the time, she printed in Goody's Ladybook. What is the Goody's Ladybook? Well, it was the first successful women's magazine and most widely circulated magazine in the antebellum United States. This was basically vogue for pre-Civil War America. She was basically the first Anna Winter, Oprah, Ariana Huffington. Goody's Lady Book offered fashion illustrations and advice, literary pieces, and articles on current events and popular culture. Guys, she published Edgar Allan Poe. Remember that guy? Essentially, she printed these ideas in the magazine and in print, so when Lincoln said, four score and 20 pies ago, the cooks in the house were ready. (laughs) I said cooks. I meant slaves and women. These publications essentially prepared kitchen folk for days upon days of chipping, chopping, gutting, beating, battering, preparing, cooking, and complaining that they had no help, and that there was absolutely nothing to watch on the non-existent TV to have on in the background. If you were to look back, the food says she promoted and prompted women to get for it to be considered a proper Thanksgiving meal. You know, just like the pilgrims had, they had to have a roasted turkey with sage stuffing, mashed turnips, mashed potato dishes, and all of the things we think of today. And as we've gone over before, unless she had a recipe for boiled swan and a whole lot of not pie, her books were big sellers but fantastically inaccurate. What she did in those books, though, in those pages, in all of those books, she did some planting of her own. She planted her dream of a nationally recognized Thanksgiving, plated it right there in the Zeitgeist. She did the same for white wedding dresses and Christmas trees, but that's a whole different episode. I'm running out of time. About 25 years after Thanksgiving was declared, by Honest Abe himself, this excerpt from Miss Perloa's Kitchen Companion was written by Maria Perloa in 1887. Everyone get ready to clutch some pearls. (laughs) Quote, During the week preceding Thanksgiving, the New England housekeeper is a busy woman. All over the country, but especially in New England, men and women look forward to the holiday as a time for going to old homes, a family day. Remember, the chief aim is to produce happiness, and that many of the company will not be wholly happy if the mistress of the household must pass a good part of the day in the kitchen. On this account, the greater the preparations made in advance, the better, so as to relieve the housekeeper of as many duties and as much anxiety as possible of the holiday. Eek. So it looks like Sarah Josepha Hale got her wish. And while I'm coming down pretty hard here on some of the published internalized misogyny, we have to take it for the time that it was printed. Given that this was a book for women and published by a woman, this was a huge success and in many ways groundbreaking, even if it's cringy to look at through today's lenses. And truth be told, Sarah Josepha Hale was a strong and fierce advocate of educating women. She preached for giving women the opportunity to teach and work. Her correct argument was that since men could go to college, graduate school, and be seated at the table, see each other in academic settings, etc., they would be more prepared to lead and be taken seriously. So far, so good. She rightfully thought that women should be at those tables too, which is great. She, however, stayed silent on slavery, which we all know silent sides with the oppressor. Had she penned even one article in her incredibly influential magazines, advocated even one-eighth as much as she did to abolish slavery as she did to get mashed potatoes on the table on the fourth Thursday in November, imagine the genuine good she could have done. Boo. So other writers got in on the Thanksgiving fantasy, too. Jane Austen did for Thanksgiving what Fifty Shades of Grey did for certain adult extracurricular activities. She just dove in there into the fantasy without doing any actual research. She wrote that pilgrims enjoyed a feast of roasted turkey stuffed with beech nuts alongside venison, roasted meat, oysters, clam chowder. Let's be real. It was probably the New England style, because it's better. Sea biscuit, 
which all I could think of is the horse, which is an unsettling image on someone's table. Quote, bread, butter, ale, and root beer. You know, they're traditional classics that they never had in 1621. And while all of that sounds delicious, except for Seabiscuit, <laughs> the blatant disregard for the history didn't help. I mean, it did. It helped white folks feel better about eating a ton of food and giving blanketed thanks based on a falsehood. She neglected to write about the deaths due to starvation and malnutrition that occurred in the Plymouth colony that winter. But hey, her book sold copies, and as a result, like Twitter retweets of the 1800s, authors repeated Jane Austen because, y'all, it's Jane freaking Austen. Then they used her account as the framework for plays and... The kicker? It was adopted by school curricula. I don't think we even had Texas yet, and we already started messing up educational systems. It was these writings that promoted and miseducated the American public about the hopeful image of the holiday classic, A Very Pilgrim Thanksgiving, A Feast to Remember by Hallmark. These inaccuracies fed more than the people around the table. It fed popular culture and the narrative that everything was hunky-dory. The first Thanksgiving was just about peace and everything was fine. Fine. Just don't look. We're fine. Just fine. Hey, look. Pie. Alexander Hamilton himself. I'm sure you've heard of him. He was a huge star on Broadway. He proclaimed that no citizen of the United States should refrain from Turkey on Thanksgiving Day, though his in-laws slaves may not have been included in the idea of citizens. The turkey that is raised and eaten today is very different from the wild turkey known in the 1600s, and even to Mr. Alexander Hamilton, Sarah Josepha Hale, and Jane Austen. The species of turkey that was native to the Americas evolved over 5 million years ago. Walking dinosaurs indeed. At least five turkey subspecies are still found in 48 states, Mexico, and Canada. A separate species, the oscillated turkey, which I'm imagining a turkey with its head spinning around like a whirly gig, is rare but still found in the Yucatan Peninsula. This part's my favorite. Wild turkeys can fly up to 55 miles an hour. That's almost highway speeds. They can also run 25 miles an hour. That's faster than most people, unless you're Usain Bolt. This makes them incredibly hard to catch. The best line ever uttered about Thanksgiving turkeys... WKRP in Cincinnati, quote, As God is my witness, I thought turkeys could fly. Look it up on YouTube, y'all. It's comedy gold. So now that I've set the table with one perspective on the holiday, we absolutely need to talk about another. Our image of the two groups coming together in peace and harmony, enjoying turkey, mashed potatoes, and pie was all wrong. We've been over this. And it turns out the meeting itself was not as you think either. Many Native Americans have long marked Thanksgiving as a national day of mourning, sad remembrance, not a family hoo-ha where you watch the American Kennel Club dog show. Jacqueline Keeler, a member of the Dinah Nation and Yankton Dakota Sioux, observes the day differently. She says, quote, Thanksgiving tells a story that is convenient for Americans. It's a celebration of our survival. I recognize it as a chance for my family to come together as survivors, pretty much in defiance. You see, if you look at it from another perspective, colonizers rolled in by the literal boatload, bringing diseases, stealing land, and, oh yeah, the slaughter of millions of Native people who were here for centuries before the so-called pilgrims wanted to try something new, run away from religious persecution, get their feet wet on new land then literally persecute the people who were here first and help them. According to WBUR, in 1970, 50 years ago, so my parents' lifetime for sure, and 11 years before I was born, those who had ties to the Mayflower wanted to have a big banquet, celebrate landing on Plymouth, and decided to invite a Wampanoag man named Wamsutta Frank James to make a speech. You know, be accurate. Invite representation so the newspapers could show us all getting together in harmony, like the days of yore. But there was, as there almost always is, a rule. 
You see, Wamsada Frank James had to show the party people his speech before he was allowed to give it. They said it was to check for spelling and grammar, which, y'all, he's an adult. He doesn't need spell check. But really, just as the holiday is sanitized and curated, these descendants of the Mayflower also wanted to keep the illusion alive. They wanted to make sure he was going to play nice. And since he didn't praise the pilgrims for their generosity, the pilgrims' descendants uninvited him. I'm pretty sure this is where Tina Fey got the idea of Mean Girls. So this is a terrible look. Y'all, they offered instead to write his speech, which isn't really how speeches go unless you're the president and you have a hired speechwriter. Which they didn't. So in the spirit of what happened at Plymouth, not once but now twice, 400 years apart, Wamsada Frank James refused to speak someone else's words. Good for him. And he instead rallied a group of folks, went to the top of Coles Hill in Plymouth on November 27th, 1970. And he spoke the truth on that hilltop. And that's the story we need to hear over the loud sanitized version, turkey gifts and football games. This is the first national day of mourning, and it has been going on every year ever since. And instead of a feast, like I will be eating and maybe you, indigenous people may fast for 24 hours to honor and remember their ancestors. They go a whole day without eating while we stuff ourselves silly on cornbread. They choose to remember the diseases, the hardship, the land grabbing, the murder, the kidnappings, the massacres, the fiction, and the gaslighting, and celebrate their survival. Indigenous unity came out of the National Day of Mourning as Indigenous folks from around the world now speak out about their experiences and their history on that day. So last year, Keisha James, granddaughter of Wamsada Frank James, implored people to learn about the true history of Thanksgiving. She asked that people take the time to learn about the tribe whose land you're on, which you can do right now at native-land.ca. There will be a link in the show notes. It's not, quote, Indian land with a broad stroke. There are individual tribes. Some overlap, some are carved out, but this is where we live and we should learn about it truthfully, not sanitized. And once you know where you live, you can then look up into the tribe's struggles, particularly from native voices if possible, and then donate if you can. And she goes on to say, to try to divorce your Thanksgiving celebrations from the Thanksgiving mythology as we discussed at the beginning of this episode. No more pilgrims and Indians, no more teaching your children about the first Thanksgiving as we learn about it in public schools where it was a friendly meal. Because now you know it wasn't. And the short-lived tolerance was mistaken for brotherhood and was discarded less than a decade later when the colonizers murdered 500 Pequoia people a few years later. The first meal wasn't a feast of brotherhood, it was politics. These were not nameless faceless native people, or as I imagined as a kid, all the native people traversing the country to welcome the colonizers onto the shores with high fives and a hot dish. The Wampanoags were there for three days, in part for sure because it was a long journey. It took two days to walk, but politics takes time. This was like the G8 summit, but between colonizers and the Wampanoags. Massasoit, the great sachem of the Wapanoag Federation, was invited by Governor Buzzkill Bradshaw to join the pilgrims for an autumnal feast to celebrate their first successful harvest. This part is by all accounts that I could find true. Massasoit came with approximately 90 warriors and brought food to add to the feast, including the five deer, lobster, fish, (laughs) birds, clams, oysters, eel, corn, squash, maple syrup. We've been over that. Again, no big fat butterball, wild turkey was on the menu, not the bourbon. Massasoit and the 90 warriors stayed in Plymouth for three days. They didn't need a specific day of thanks. Every day was worthy of thanks and it was given to the creator. This was not for them. The Wampanoags, as it so happens, had been able to create a peaceful and actionable agreement with other tribes in the area. The Wampanoags were able to teach the English folk how to survive that first year, again, of which half of the 102 Mayflower people made it through that first year. The Wampanoags weren't magic. They couldn't make everyone survive, but they did the best they could. 
The English folk were starving and sick and freezing and unprepared and unable to survive in what they called the new land, which was very, very, very old land. My ancestors, and maybe yours too, were the ones who did them in by backtracking on the agreement, encroaching on the Wampanoag land, and the peace rapidly fell apart within 10 years, and disease rapidly swept through the native communities. And in fact, the first time the word Thanksgiving was even used was over 10 years after that first political chit-chat. The first official mention of a Thanksgiving celebration was in 1637, after the colonists murdered an entire Pequot village. They used Thanksgiving to celebrate the slaughter. President Washington actually tried to start the holiday in 1789, but he didn't use any of the Wampanoag or Saddler's lingo. It really was, in his head, a day of thinking and thanking, but just really for white people. Someone had to cook the birds and make the food and clean the seating areas. Someone had to watch the kids. So some people might enjoy a day of thanks. There was an asterisk always next to all men should give thanks. And that asterisk included only those that they saw as real men. Not native people, not women, not kids, and certainly not black people. And that asterisk is still very present in many arenas of today's life, too. Then Sarah Josepha Hale decided to sanitize the Thanksgiving idea. Take this old idea, dust it off, polish it, and yes, appropriate the idea and the truth behind the first feast for an antebellum audience to sell cookbooks, to maybe give thanks, sure, but to maybe have a big feast and do the thing that we all know today, absolutely, but it was a sanitized lie. As American as apple pie. Then the 1920s happened. European immigrants started coming again and again and again, and what happens when new immigrant populations come to America to be welcomed by Lady Liberty's outstretched torch some immigrant populations that come before somehow, for whatever reason, feel justified in claiming that they are somehow more American than the ones that follow and try to close the door behind them. I got here, but not you. You're not American enough. Go back to your country. It is as American as apple pie. And as the waves came with more immigrants, the Protestant Americans who were already here, maybe who descended from those who massacred indigenous people, they feared being displaced. The idea of what it took to be a, quote, real American, whatever that means, had to be established. And so the colonial ideology became the cornerstone of the arch that new immigrants had to walk through. Americanism was now defined for new immigrants with the idea that the colonists were the good guys. That everyone came together at the table, hand in hand, saying this land is my land. Maybe ironically, maybe not. And started to spread the untruth of the peaceful meal between the OG pilgrims and the broad brushstroke Indians. I mean, they also left out the death and disease and destruction and demolition and demands and massacres and politics that they'd for sure be totes dead, dead, dead without Massasoit and the Wampanoags, half of which survived because of the kindness and tolerance of the Wampanoags. And the other half were dead, and I'm guessing maybe at the most peace that they've ever been. And that they went back and did all these murders, centuries of genocide, and again and again for 200 years. President Andrew Jackson relegated them to reservations, which essentially killed millions more Native Americans and pretended none of it even happened before because, hey, look, pie! The kidnapping of Native American children as they were sent to American boarding schools where their hair was cut, their language was beaten out of them, they were forced to assimilate to American suburban lifestyles with the white picket fence. By 1920, the story of, quote, pilgrims and Indians became a story that every American school child was taught, even in Native schools. We whitewashed and gaslit Native kids and took away their history and their own stories and replaced it with pilgrim hat stuffing and apple pie. According to Sean Sherman, member of the Aglala Lakota Sioux tribe and contributor to time, Thanksgiving really has nothing to do with Native Americans and everything to do with the old, but not the oldest, guard, conjuring a lie of the first people welcoming the settlers to bolster their false authority over what makes a real American. Remember, 
only in 1924 were Native Americans allowed to become citizens of the United States, and it took decades more for all the states to permit us to vote. It is a story of supposed unity, drained of the bloodshed, and built for the sake of division. And while the OG Wampanoag thought that every day should be a day of thanks, it's important not to think of Native people only on Thanksgiving, shrouded in this Americanized fiction. Remember, we're the ones who have a national bird, the bald eagle. But every time you hear a cry on a TV show, you're hearing a red-tailed hawk because it sounds better than what most people would call an embarrassing cry from a national symbol. Y'all, we invented gaslighting, so none of this should be surprising. So think of Native Americans when you hear of our American story, but also you have to think of them with intentionality. You have to go and research and read and hear their voices because we don't know what we don't know and it's easier to pretend we don't know. And when you hear of things even to this day, remember COVID-19 disproportionately affects tribal communities more so than any other population here in the States. From the CDC, Recent studies show that American Indian and Alaska Natives are at higher risk for severe COVID-19 outcomes. Continuing racial inequity and historical trauma caused disparities in health and socioeconomic factors between American Natives and white populations, which negatively affect tribal communities. And when Gabby Petito was horrifically murdered in Wyoming just a few months ago, a white woman who suffered from a horrible abuse and her murderer was tracked down, the reporters descended upon Wyoming, cameras rolling. Internet detectives spent countless hours on Reddit and Twitter and combing security footage in the hopes that they might be the one to start their own show a la Steve Martin, Martin Short, and Selena Gomez's characters in Only Murders in the Building, which is a great show, by the way. But those cameras never rolled for the thousands of missing and murdered indigenous people in the same area. Many of these murders and missing people do not ever get a shred of attention from the American media despite their death toll from murders being 10 times that of someone who looks like me. Some things are maybe changing a little for the better, but even as the gauge ticks up, there is still a long way to go. So while you are enjoying your turkey or tofurkey or maybe a little more authentic dinner of lobster, a wild turkey, or in my vegetarian case, all the sides twice over, rolls, and a different wild turkey, or that you're enjoying traditional oysters and a dead deer, give thanks certainly. For me, I'm going to be thankful for my husband and our house and our daughter and my cool dog and pets, my wonderful friends from around the country, all y'all who are listening, and Deb Haaland. She is the first Native American to be appointed as Secretary of the Interior by President Biden. She also launched a missing and murdered unit within the Bureau of Indian Affairs Office of Justice Services. She intends to shed light and pursue justice for missing or murdered American Indians and Alaskan Natives, something that is long overdue and has been ignored for far, far too long. So don't just give thanks and think of American indigenous people just when you think of turkey dinner. Think of them every day and learn what really happened and its effects that still ring hard today. And pay attention every single day. And when they protest for clean water and clean air, a chance to vote, help seeking justice, we should be paying attention. And if we can, elevate those voices and do something every single day. Thank you. So, thank you today for joining me on Bewilder Beasts. So instead of me asking you to go check out Patreon or follow me on Twitter, take the time and go learn about Indigenous people in your area. And see if you can share some of what you learned today. If there are topics that you'd be interested in hearing about on the podcast, know of any historical animals who changed the world, animals who help humans or wacky animals in the news, send them in to bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com. I'm Melissa McHugh McGrath with Mud Stuff Media. Go get curious. I got today's information from smithsonianmag.com, onthisday.com, wikipedia.org, time.com, Britannica.com, AmericanIndian.si.edu, 
news.harvard.edu, the CDC, ktla.com, WBUR, MASHP, Wampanoag Tribe-NSN.gov, native-land.ca. I'm in Wabanaki lands and need to do some more reading. Links, as always, are in the description of today's episode. Intro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Leibowitz, and interstitial music is by MK2. Additional music is provided by Pixabay and Freesound.org. Share what you learned today with your curious friends. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you next week.